Welcome everybody to this coffee talk. Um, the way we thought we'd do this to leave plenty of time for conversation would be for Rob and I to very briefly go through the findings of the Making Mentor um, Mentorship work project that we did, uh, Making Mentoring work, and then leave a lot of time for q and I think most of the people on here have already seen us give this presentation at least once, so we'll buzz through this fairly quickly just as a reminder if nothing else. And I would say, recall that we are high grading findings. Um, these are not all of the findings, really encourage you to read the report, but these are the things that stood out to us and hopefully we'll start some um, conversation. I'm gonna start a timer here so I don't go too, uh, go too long. And we can um, use most of this time for that conversation. So please be not just um, watching YouTube videos, Although you can do that too, multitask, but please think about questions through that dialogue is where we learn and we have another round of this research coming. So we definitely want to um, capture what you all are thinking. Okay, let me jump into this. Alrighty, so on the call today, we have uh, myself, then Rob Southwick, and then Phil Sang, um, all of which were instrumental in doing most of the work on this. I was just the guy kibitzing in the background most of the time, so thank you very much, you gents, and all of your staff for helping with this. Okay, why did we do this project to begin with? Um, basically, it's just this, that our community has been talking about mentoring as sort of the golden fleece solution to R3 ever since I've been involved with what we now call R3. However, not many of us, if any of us, have done any actual rigorous explore, exploration of what that market might be. Can we rely on other hunters and shooting sports participants to recruit the next generation? If we can rely on them, to what degree? Um, can, and then all of the aspects surrounding that. So we don't know the size of the populations. We don't necessarily know what they want. There's a lot of questions still unanswered. But what this research tried to do, and I think we did, was we got a foundation of questions answered by which we can start to ask better and more nuanced questions in the future. The process we went through, um, it, I think it was a fairly solid one. Basically, we started by trying to figure out what it was that other folks were doing out there, primarily state fish and wildlife agencies, but also conservation NGOs. So what are the programs or efforts out there that were calling themselves mentoring programs? We catalog those to try to understand some of the characteristics about them. With the help of all the R3 regional committees, which I want to give a big shout out to, their expertise, um, their, their guidance through this whole process, couldn't have done it without y'all, and frankly, we wouldn't have answered any of the right questions without their input. Um, we work to, with them to identify what specific topics about this cloud of, of issues we're, we call mentoring that we should focus on in this research. Um, we knew we were going to have to get to a survey to ask potential mentors and potential mentees some questions. So to make sure that those surveys were solid, we started with focus groups. So online focus groups, this is where uh, Phil Sang and DJ Case was instrumental. I highly encourage anybody who is interested in doing focus groups, whether for agency work or otherwise, um, take a look at these online forums that Phil's an expert at. It turned out to be incredibly instructive. We learned a lot and helped really zero in on the issues we wanted to ask about in our survey. Then we submitted that survey, I think to just under 7,000 respondents, um, well represented, evenly represented across ages as well as ethnicities and other demographics across the United States. And then we crunched the data as always. So let's look at what some of those, again, high graded points that surprised us or were confirming um, resulted from crunching some of those data. So I'm gonna do about half of these and then I'm gonna turn it over to Rob and he'll do the other half. Again, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly for two reasons. Again, I think most of you have already seen this presentation, number one and number two, the full report is out there and you should really read it. So we're not gonna give you all the gems here, just enough to tickle your fancy to wanna to go and read a little bit more. So first, some back of the napkin math, based on what we found in our survey, about 10% of 
Um, survey respondents said they were at least moderately interested to very interested in going hunting, and about 18% said they were moderately to very interested in going target shooting. Well, if you scale that up to the U.S. population, basically what that means is there's about 50 million Americans out there who have some level of interest in going hunting um, or getting involved in the shooting sports. That's a pretty good market. So, um, question number one is the potential is there. You never know, a small sample size. Well, I wasn't that small. 6,000 people is pretty good. But there may be some bias there. But at, the, at a minimum, we have tens of millions of Americans who are wanting to do these activities um, but need a little bit of help. And again, these are people who said they were interested not just to do it, but interested to learn from the instruction or guidance from another. Now, that's the good news. Some bad news. I don't know if it's bad. It just is. The programs that we are currently calling mentoring programs probably are not. Again, you can look at this in the report, but when we actually dug into those programs that we have been calling mentoring programs, by and large, most of them were still too narrow in scope, too short in duration, and had a much higher student to instructor ratio than is probably appropriate for mentoring. And so most of them were actually like um, skills instruction programs. Things that the, I think the average instructor to student ratio was like one to 12. That was the average. Well, that's probably not exactly what we're talking about when, when we're thinking about this thing of mentoring. This, what I'll say, the, the organic model, which is sort of one experienced participant takes out another novice participant, close to a one-to-one -one relationship. So most of what we're doing um, really isn't that. So our question is, well, well how should we define mentoring? And, and we, we went over this quite a bit. Um, it's, it's, you can see the definition that we used with the advice of the R3 committees to try to put a narrow band around what we're going to call a quote-unquote mentoring program versus something like an instruction program, a skills training program, or even a trial hunt. Okay, now this one has probably stirred up more controversy in the past several weeks since Rob and I dropped this than anything else. And that is, of those that we sampled, which remember are primarily adults, actually almost exclusively adults, when we ask them the preferred term, that they want to refer their instructors, uh, or they want um, their instructor to be referred as, it isn't mentor. Um, I think it was summed up best by one of the young ladies in our um, uh, focus groups, and that is that mentor is a title that somebody has to earn from somebody else and then is granted by that somebody else. So at least among the adults that we sampled, they didn't prefer it. They liked instructor much more, um, the mentors themselves were kind of split on it. They didn't really care as much. They were fine with instructor. So I don't think this is a hard and fast rule across all demographics. I'm not sure. But what I can tell you is, at least among adults who are novice or haven't tried it, their perception is that mentor is too value laden for what they are particularly interested in. These folks are interested in instruction. They're interested in a little bit of guidance, but they would, it's up to them to decide to call that person a mentor rather than us saying, hey, this person is your mentor. Um, interestingly, of those that, again, in our, in our study did indicate they were at least moder moderately interested in the hunting or shooting sports, um, many of them had already tried it once or tried it a few times, but still felt that without guidance, they wouldn't do it again. So a large proportion hadn't done it at all, but many had. And I think that's really interesting. That, that validates a lot of the other conversation that we have had in the R3 space for a long time. And that is just because somebody tries it once does not mean they are hooked for life and that they need additional instruction. And in, in our case, these adults that we're looking at, they wanted more, something closer to one-on-one -on -one personal instruction. So we've got a, a large range out there. And what I would focus on is, hey, if we, if we have this many people, you know, 37% of potential hunting students and 46% of potential target students, target shooting students that, that want instruction, they've already tried it once, that to me is some low hanging fruit. Okay, this one was encouraging, though not necessarily complete. Um, when we asked both potential students and potential instructors, their preference 
Well, this is just students. Well, let me start with students. Their preference for instructor, does age matter? Does gender of the um, instruction instructor matter? Uh, it really doesn't. I really encourage you all to look at the results here. That was that surprised us. We thought there would be a strong um, preference there, and it isn't. Now, let me say a couple things. One is people's stated preferences sometimes don't match up with their behaviors. So this could be a case of they're saying what they think is the right thing to say, but they may still be motivated um, in other directions. I don't know for sure. The other thing we didn't look at was um, ethnicity or other cultural factors that they may throw a, show a strong preference for. We'd like to correct that in our next round of research to understand that a little bit more. But at least on the outset, folks are thinking along the right lines and that gives us some more flexibility to use the current mentor base that we have. Um, another encouraging thing is that most hunters and recreational shooters that call themselves that are already mentoring. There was um, only a small percentage, well, uh, it, it really kind of two groups. People who were already mentoring, even if they didn't call themselves mentors, they were already instructing, even if they didn't call themselves instructors, and then those that just flat out weren't interested in doing it. And unfortunately, there is a, a strong component of those out there that just aren't interested in doing it. But the good news is many are, all, are already out there um, mentoring, and these ones are probably the ones that are more likely to take somebody else out. Now, we should note that they have a preference for friends and family, um, and they don't see themselves as instructors, so they need a little bit of encouragement. But it's good news for us because they already see it as the ethos of hunting and shooting sports that, hey, you just you teach somebody else. The downside is that they're doing it for their friends and family. And if we're going to ask them to go outside of that circle, we're going to have to do a little bit of work. And this, this emphasizes that point. Um, if it's not gonna be their friend or family, how do we get these individuals to wanna take out an adult? As it turns out, a, um, a reference from another hunter or shooter that they trust is the best way to get them to take out somebody new. An organization like an agency did not come out at the top of the best ways to incentivize one of these existing hunters or shooters to take somebody out. However, I think some more work needs done there. The scale at which you can invite people may make that worth it, but I think we should do some, some work into how do we maybe make mentor recruitment cores. So existing mentors, hunters and shooters, getting them to recruit more mentors, not necessarily more students. And I'm, and I'm interchanging mentors and mentee. I'm still stuck in the habit. Um, I'm gonna try to say instructor and potential student. I was gonna correct you on that in a minute. But All right, I saw it, yeah, it's like, yeah. Okay. Is this, uh, is this my slide, Rob, or is this yours? That's yours. Keep going. Okay. Two more. So, um, reinforcing sort of what do, what are mentors' preferences? Um, inherently, they're not necessarily interested in instructing those outside their social circles. So, a lot like we suspected, this, this thing we're calling mentoring is very socially driven. We're talking about small social groups, my friend, my family. That makes sense for me to take somebody out. People can do that fairly easily. And, and it's what we're talking about, this organic mentoring. What that means is this quote unquote programmatic mentoring that we've been talking about, that's something different. And it's not intuitive for these folks to do that. So we have to recognize we're asking them to do something outside of their natural comfort zone. Um, now, as I said before, the best way to get or to get somebody to take a student out is for someone within their social circle to ask them to do so. But if we take that out of the equation, the preference of potential mentors is having a trusted organization um, facilitate their introduction to a prospective student. And interestingly, state fish and wildlife agencies are right at the top of trusted organizations. We had anticipated. Uh, based on some political um, trends that we've seen, that, that might not be the case. But as it turns out, state fish and wildlife agencies, as well as conservation NGOs, are trusted brokers of getting a mentor and mentee together if it's outside that social circle or instructor and student. Okay, All Rob, right. take it away. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, Matt focused more so on, you could call it the higher levels or strategic concepts to how we position mentoring programs and what is mentoring. 
Um, I'll touch a little bit on that, but I'm going to focus more on some of the tactical insights about how what you can do directly in some of the, your programs. Again, as Matt had mentioned, there's a lot more in the report, and as questions come up, we can address those two during the discussion. Um, it's really important to note that um, incentives are not as important as some may have thought they were. We had a lot of questions about that early on, that you know, do I need to give people t-shirts and freebies in order to mentor? No. No, as Matt had touched on briefly, people mentor because it's part of their ethos. It's part of passing it on. It's something that's important to them. They want to share it with others. That's the true motivation. However, there is like an overlap between what you call incentives and what you can call support. So there's a lack, an overlap in there. So a person may say, hey, I don't need a T-shirt or I don't need a free whatever or a free dinner to, to be a mentor. But if you make it easier for me, take the burden off of me, I'm more likely to be, to be an instructor. Two, you got me. So I'm more likely to be an instructor if you help me get out there. So given the access to places to hunt, maybe special hunts, equipment for their, their the student is, is really important. So support is important, incentives are not, and there's a little bit of overlap in there. We had some people in the focus groups, um, and I do really encourage you to look at those focus groups, um, not just this, for the aspects of the mentoring, but just in the, in the new world that we're in. Um, Phil, Matt Harlow did an outstanding job with these online focus groups. And what's so good about them, in my opinion, is that it's not just the opinion of people in one town, it's the opinion of people across the US. You can build focus groups that have people from all across your state or all across the country, and you can do many um, for the price of doing a few in the past. So I highly recommend you check it out just for that standpoint. I think a lot of states and jails will get more information in the future with that approach. Um, okay, so back to the points on here. Uh, and during the focus group, people were saying, you know, I'd, I'd like to be an instructor, but I'm just not qualified. You know, we had one, one person that had just graduated about a year or so ago from a state program, and they're very interest, interested because they wanted to pass on to somebody else. They were grateful for their experience, and they wanted to go on. And we're trying, uh, the point is, you don't have to be a 30-year expert out there in the field. You can help people because even if they have a minimum amount of experience, they have a whole lot more experience than those beginners we're trying to teach. So support them, give them information, checklists of what to teach, what to go through, what to say, and then help them with the access to hunting, background checks, and more. Go ahead, Matt. Next. There we go. Um, just like mentors, you know, they, they tend to like to go with um, family and friends. Same with the students. They'd rather learn from somebody that they really know. But they see that the person is expert, that is backed up, is supported. doesn't have to be, you know, again, 30 years of experience expert, but they know what they're talking about and they have people behind them supporting works. Go ahead. So it's all a matter of make sure you let people know that, hey, we have people that can really help you out here. Um, a little editorial there. This is an important part that's um, important to me, not just in recruiting mentors or instructors and potential new students, but everything we do as state agencies, NGOs, and the wildlife conservation area. We cannot forget the proper way to communicate when we're recruiting new instructors and when we're recruiting new students. Our students haven't drank the Kool-Aid yet. They're not going into the outdoor shops on a regular basis to see signs. They're not getting emails from the state agencies. To recruit these potential new students, we saw it was 50 million potential of them, and maybe 10% will actually move on it, which would be great, but we've got to go to them. So local newspapers, um, you've got to, we've got to get out of our comfort zone to, to get them, but our potential new instructors, we have to reach them in different channels. So don't put all your communications into one line of communication. It will not work well at all. Next. So kind of some bullet points here, the next two slides to wrap this up. Um, Looked like a lot of people were saying, hey, I'd be willing to help teach someone to introduce them to hunting or shooting, but I really have an idea who this person is before I go out into the field with them and hand them a live firearm. So have like a meet and greet, maybe they can meet each other, just kind of like a fraternity or sorority recruiting type of party, but let, get them together and let them talk to each other would help. Safety, safety, safety is critical. Um, we know our programs have safety built into it. Hey, you're getting ahead of me, buddy. Um, we know safety is important. But they don't, our potential new students, they don't know. And also it's not about their safety, they are concerned about are they safe around other people? They don't wanna go into a program and endanger other people 
they want to know somebody will help them. That's actually a point we see in other research, but it ties right into here too. Safety is people around me and me around them. As Matt had mentioned, there's a lot of different groups that we tested out there that could host mentoring programs. And we know it's going to be probably a number of partnerships, NGOs working with states, working with local businesses, working with retailers and industry. But the front organization, wildlife agencies and NGOs tend to have that brand that people trust. Remember, these new students haven't drank the Kool-Aid. They're not already hunting and shooting. So they want to go with someone they feel comfortable with that is established, reliable, dependable, safe, secure. Go ahead. And like us gray hairs, the newer generation really wants to get into hunting because they want to, to bring home their own meat. It's not about securing meat, they can go to the store and buy it, but it's a lot more value in meat that they harvest on their own. So look at these local board programs as a great new place to go out and recruit new students, whether it's local uh, markets, farmers markets, and so forth. Go ahead. This one also raised some questions after we first released the report. People said they're more likely to go into a program to learn how to hunt or shoot if they had somebody with them that they knew, somebody that they could lean on. So BOGO type programs are good. However, the comment was, if your program's designed for people to meet other potential hunting and shooting partners, this could backfire because somebody goes into a program with somebody they know, they'll be tight with that person during the event. So just how you structure your program may depend on how you want to promote it and market it. So if you're not trying to pair people up, consider two for one type of offers. Some kind of recognition is good. It's not critical. I saw the comment earlier about how important is the issue overall, but some kind of certificate, low cost, so they can show people that, yes, I did complete the program. I ain't BSing you. I really did the program. That could help get other people interested in, in becoming students also. Um, small groups is, is the definition of, of a mentoring program is typically small groups, but even our potential new students want to work in small groups. Part of that might go back towards the safety element, have a better eye on what's going on, them towards everybody else and the instructors towards the class, but also just for the attention and quality learning experience, I would suspect too, something we could test further. And then finally, um, you know, maybe I'm biased in this because we are a statistical research firm, but the whole mentoring program so far across states of everything that we do has it looks like the least amount of analytics behind it how do we know if we're improving over time how do we know if we're improving our effectiveness and in recruiting instructors and students please consider some kind of basic metric we have some ideas in the report but something you can use to see are you improving over time as you make adjustments all right matt i think the next one is back to you to wrap it up and then we'll go to discussions sure Okay, so thanks for the patience during that rapid fire. I know we were both talking fast, throwing a lot of um, thoughts at you. Uh, again, if, if your only takeaway is that was confusing, uh, that's perfect because you should go and read the report. Uh, again, this is for too long in R3 as well as a lot of other human dimensions related issues. We like to look for silver bullets and simple answers. I'm sorry, those don't exist. These are long form questions uh, that require even longer form answers and very nuanced, sophisticated answers. So let's shy away from the intellectual mediocrity of just saying, oh, it's just this one thing. And instead, realize people are complicated machines and we need to understand all those aspects. So to do that, get yourself informed, read the report, and that should be a rule for all of us. Um, the, we do have round two through a multi-state conservation grant. Um, that uh, that one starts the first of the year, right, Rob? Yes. Or is that yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so I, I'm, I'm still confused between the modern multi-state grant and the regular one. Um, we, grants will be happening in the next six months, lots of them, so all of us stay tuned. Uh, but we wanna look into some of this stuff further. And in order to do that, we're gonna need to query the community some more. So all of the thoughts, ideas, criticisms, challenges, um, keep those coming. Those help us understand the state of, of the field and allow us to do some better research. So expect some more from us in querying um, you all probably through the regional associations. And what I would ask of all of you though right now um, is to take an active role as a function of either this presentation and subsequent conversation or reading the report. Um, fire us off some questions, some things that that you that are that arise in your mind, whether it's a new question, whether it's the way we asked a question you don't like, you'd like it re-asked, anything at all. All of that stuff is good. 
Um, send that stuff to Rob or I, so we can start cataloging that and can use that to inform the next round. Uh, the intellectual um, trust is within you all and we rely on it incredibly heavily. So please help us make sure we uh, use these resources to the fullest. Okay, I think that's good for me. So I will stop sharing my screen and then Kristen, um, go back to you and field some questions, I hope. Yeah, and Phil and Trump, you're mute. Yeah, I just had great job, guys. I had just a couple of things I wanted to add, uh, two that are tactical and two that are kind of big picture. First on the tactical side, Rob mentioned it a lot, and I just want to totally validate that business about safety came through so strong, especially in the focus groups. And not only safety, but the, the credibility of the instructors. Again, we take it for granted. We pick the right people for the right reasons, but they don't know that. So any opportunity to talk about safety and why these instructors are, why people should be willing to listen to them is a uh, high priority. And then coming to the incentives, um, as, as both of you guys mentioned, they didn't want kits, they didn't want t-shirts and stuff. But one thing that did come up a lot was uh, access, either access to land or tags or um, uh, just capability. So, and you could get it right early, I, I get it. I'm reluctant to take 10 people into my honey hole but if you can, get, and I'll take 10 people if you can give me places to take them where they have a reasonable chance of, of um, seeing game and, and potentially harvesting that doesn't come out of my pocket, so to speak. So I thought that was an important incentive idea that came up um, in the focus groups. And then big picture, I was really surprised at just the willingness of people to be an instructor slash mentor um, if asked but the real need for, and to me, the kind of the big, the big aha moment to me in the focus groups was that need for a broker, you know, a, a credible broker for these relationships. So we had uh, instructor or mentors, we just use the mentor mentee for the moment, because we're all familiar with that language. Mentors are willing to do that if they were asked by a, a credible uh, institution or, or organization and people that said they, they wanted what that person had to offer if they, could, if they could trust them, if they were credible and the right um, group put that together. So to me, that was a, a real, uh, the real opportunity as we've all struggled with this, how do we, how do we scale this up for, for, for decades, really? We've been talking about how this whole one-on-one, -on -one, you know, the, the, the true mentor relationship is critical to this but how do we scale it up? How do you bring that in mass? And maybe that's a key role that agencies and organizations can play is, is brokering those opportunities. So that's all I got. Thanks guys. Awesome. Thanks Phil. Um, so Matt, I kind of want to respond to your note about silver bullets. I read something earlier that said um, shortcuts are the best way to make more work for you in the long run. And so I just thought that was really funny. I was reading something about uh, training for equestrian sports, but it, it still applies, so. Um, we do have a question from Mike Christensen with Pass It On Outdoor Mentors. He says, where does the issue with the term mentor fall in the scale of importance? And I know we've talked about that some before about kind of keeping the mentorship term um, in the field and then using something like instructor or teacher when we're talking to the general public. Um, so it's a B2B to, B to B versus B2C type issue. Um, but how important do you think that is overall? I'll take a crack at it and then I'll let Rob um, or Phil uh, hone in on that. I, I've thought about this a lot since this report came out because this was the first thing that as, as we suspected, <laughs> this was the first thing that everybody started crying foul on. And I think that's fair. Um, I would state it this way. The term is very, has a lot of cultural charge to it. So how important it is it depends on who you're talking to at the moment. So within our community, as long as we can all be honest with what mentoring actually is, that it isn't a skills training program, that we are talking about this, some sort of special sauce, this magic that happens when you have one individual that takes out another individual or maybe two at the, you know, at the most, a very small um, group of folks, multiple times over time and uh, sort of allows, uh, facilitates those individuals' journeys. As long as we're honest with that, um, I, 
within our community, I think we can use the terms just fine. I think with kids as well, it's less important. I don't know what it's like with their parents, but for kids programs and maybe even um, through you know, high school or tweeners, it's, that's, the mentoring isn't a problem because everybody in their life is a coach or an instructor or a mentor and they're okay with it. However, if we are trying to target adult, not what, what, what we sort of inaccurately call non-traditionals, those that aren't necessarily a part of the hunting culture, what we heard is that in cultures outside of sort of the hunting and shooting cultures, Mentor is a thing that is often assigned at work. Like, hey, you're assigned this mentor at, at, at your job and everybody hates it. Nobody likes that. Bad connotations with that. So outside of, let's say, the outdoor industry space, mentor is a term that has very different meanings and it can be off-putting. So if that's our audience, then we shouldn't use it. Um, but if it's within this other culture, we've kind of defined these parameters. And as long as we're, we, we get honest and we don't lump in, as I say, these other kind of R3 programs and just call them all mentoring, then I think we can use it that way. I would so just, just add like, one minor part to that. And just to emphasize, we are trying to sell a product. Just like a company sells a product, we are trying to sell the hunting and shooting experience. So we're gonna to have to do some things that are uncomfortable to us to ramp up this program, to put it to scale, to be effective. We have to use terms and take, take approaches that we're not comfortable with and include um, changing terms we use, how we use to get our messages out there or advertising. Some we're gonna to have to consider and some we'll look at more in round two. Um, so otherwise everything I'm thinking Matt nailed perfectly. Well, and, and let, me, <laughs> let me just drive the nail home that I think Rob was trying to hammer. And that is, we did discover something interesting. We discovered the super mentors in our focus groups. We called them super mentors. So people like me, maybe people like Rob, maybe a lot of you folks who take out lots of people every year and we have for our entire career, we love the term mentor. We love it. It's part of our identity. However, if you look at the, the research, those that don't identify as the super mentor, they don't really care. So let's remember, this is our own bias. We love this term, but outside of it, your average hunter, your average target shooter who takes out their family and friends, they're kind of meh about it. And the new audiences that Rob is talking about, they have a strong dislike. So let's just be honest with that. Phil, would you add anything to that? Yeah, just that words matter and target audiences matter, right? It's, it's just good communications. You just have to match those two as always. And the better you do that, the more effective you'll be with any given target audience. So you guys covered the ground very well. I don't, the big picture, it's not going to make or break the program, but for specific individuals, it could. That's my takeaway. Great. So just like everything else in wildlife biology, the answer is always, it depends. Um, and it, you know, I think R3 mostly comes back to marketing. So if we're marketing to certain audiences, we have to use certain speech, right? Awesome. Um, so then Steve Hall, Steve, if you want to come on camera and microphone, um, I don't know if this is meant to be a question or a statement, but either way we can discuss. Steve Hall from Texas says, will be some inconsistencies differentiating between individuals who introduce and take others hunting from hunter education instructors, and that might be confusing. Um, Steve, were you talking about in the survey results or in the field? No, just in the, in the practical use, essentially the practical use of the terms mentor and instructor. Um, you know, as an instructor, as a hunter ed instructor, that's kind of one context. And as an instructor of, uh, in, in, in the place of mentor, as somebody that's instructing an individual that's going out hunting, which we also do, of course, uh, I, I just think that the term starts to become a little more confusing. When mentor, in in my view, was working fine, but obviously, from the research, suggests that that's something that's not as, as acceptable as I thought it was. So certainly you see, in oh, sorry. Certainly, certainly more research is needed because yes, I think Steve has kind of hit on that. There's a lot of gray, a lot of squishiness, how and where to apply the term. Um, and it's not just the word instructor. Instructor is a term that Matt and I kind of settled on going through the results. Mm -hmm. uh, but the word coach ranked very highly also. Um, this one's going to evolve over time too. But yeah, we, we understand what Steve's saying. That's a big part of the, 
next round. All right. So Steve, you're saying that instructor sounds more like somebody who might be certified or specifically trained. We are certified. I can tell you that. Uh, certifiable. Um, no, I, yeah, you know, in, in our, well, let me, let me tell you that we do a lot of youth hunts, do a lot of what we call mentor hunts. And we're also hunter at instructors. And so when you say instructor, they may go back in their brain to the class that they took with you versus the fact that you're instructing them as a mentor. And I, it just gets a real confusing when we kind of, we have our lexicon already built and it just, it would just, I, I was just thinking about that word instructor and it, I was having difficulty with it. So I, I think you, you hit the point right there, Steve, is we built our lexicon irrespective of data. And every time that happens in human cultures, it turns out our words are often wrong. So, I mean, this is something we have to deal with as a community, and I don't know where we settle on it. Um, again, I think if we are sensitive to the culture that we're talking within, the context within, then I'm not sure it matters as much. In, in, in Texas, with the youth programs, if the kids don't have a problem with mentor and mentee, fine. I mean, if it's not a barrier to... Um, for those particular programs, it's not a barrier to those participants, then fine. Um, but I would, I would just challenge that if you're going to go outside that audience and you're going to target adults or those outside of um, hunting cultures, is that you may be excluding people based on that word and you'll never know you're excluding them because you're only going to be looking at the people who showed up to your program. Um, and so we have strong selection bias there. Um, and we often see those in our three programs. We do something that is selecting against an audience and we don't even know that we're selecting against them because they never show up. So we see the people that come in and we say, oh, this thing isn't a problem. But as it turns out, those are just the folks that it wasn't a problem for. And in the short term, that's okay because, hey, if our class roster is filled up, fine. But long term, if we are trying to expand hunting and shooting sports to demographics and audiences outside of our current norms, then we're gonna to have to do some of these things differently. I agree, I mean, I, I do agree with going forward. I, I just think that, uh, for example, we have mentor hunts uh, on our public hunting uh, website. And people understand that the mentors are the differentiation between youth hunts and mentor hunts. Youth hunts, we send them one way, mentor hunts, we send them the adult way. and. Um, and we never use the term mentee, so I guess that's a wash too. But, but I understand and, and, and definitely willing to, to try it. I just, the, the word instructor was the one hanging me up there and I'll, I'll get over it, I'm sure. I think it's especially a true on the margins, right? Because you have, if you have someone who is committed to, to, to getting into hunting, they don't care what you call it, right? Even if it rubs them wrong, even if they're irritated by it, even if they think it's presumptuous and all that, they're still going to do it because that's that's the that's the road. But um, on the margins, where you say like, well, you know, yeah, I think I'm kind of interested in that. But, oh, that mentor, well, that's that's presumptuous. I don't. I'm the one that decides if you're my mentor or not. Or like Matt mentioned earlier about the whole work thing, mentor has bad connotations. Hey, I, it's just a subconscious thing, but I'm just going to walk away, and you'll never know. So I think it, it's really. Um, has a lot more potential impact on the marginal participants. And if that's who we're really looking at getting, I think it's really worth considering, as painful as it might be, to try to change our lexicon. Yeah, I know that one rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, and it's going to take some getting used to considering pretty much everything in our three revolves around mentoring, right? Even the study is called making mentorship work. So um, I think sticking with mentorship and the business to business side is good practice just because we are used to our lexicon but maybe we can start to kind of branch out um, in our business to consumer stuff in marketing um, and start using instructor leader teacher something like that so moving on we do have another question from mike christensen he says do you have some examples of organizations that are brokering hunting activities and Eddie Hernan from Virginia said that they are doing that. So Eddie, do you want to kind of expand on that? Uh, yeah, br uh, briefly, I did have a question though. Uh, but yeah, since we uh, we normally, we usually had uh, Powderhook to kind of broker relationships and then that went away. So 
over the past couple of months, I've been serving that role as almost a broker between our certified mentors and uh, new hunters. And it, it, it takes a lot of work <laughs> to do that, but I think it's providing that personal touch um, and being that, that person that introdu introduces the two parties together, I think can really work. But um, I did have a question about the study and I think it's really good information for phase two is there uh, plans to dig into more of what the new hunters are when they say they want personal instruction what like dig into what they if they really understand or what they're referring to um, because it's so general and i know the the new potential mentees are there plans to try to get more people that are interested in hunting specifically into those uh, focus groups. Uh, that's, uh, those are great comments, Eddie. And frankly, I, uh, I don't think I want to answer yes or no, but I want to say um, we'll take that now into consideration that that would be helpful. Um, I, I hear a very some very tactical information that would be nice to know. So it's one thing to say a person well, when in a focus group or in a survey, you ask them, hey, would you like instruction from somebody else? Um, but and, and that that's one thing. But then to say, yeah, but what specific kind of instruction, what specific process would you prefer? Yeah, that we didn't do. Um, we did. Th there's a little bit of information in there in terms of, um, you know, the skills and experience, those type deals. But the actual tactical recommendations yeah, we didn't include in this survey, but um, Rob, I saw you taking notes. Hopefully you took note of that. Um, that is something that we can inform the next round in. Um, the second thing that you said, I, I wasn't really clear on. It was something with mentors. Can you can you say that again? Yeah, no, um, so reading through the study on your potential mentees, the overall participants, um, it, it would seem like it was heavy on the interested in shooting, but not hunting side. So I didn't, I didn't know if you guys wanted, uh, were trying to raise up that level of interested in hunting for the next, if you're, if you're planning to uh, do more focus groups in the future. Well, um, we weren't trying to select for any type of audience. What we're trying to determine is among those, among Americans, what was the level of interest for each of the activities? And what we discovered is that yeah, you're right, about 18% of those we sampled were at least moderately interested in going target shooting and only 10% of those sampled were interested in going hunting. Um, intuitively, that seems okay to me, that seems about right. I, I suspect if we asked fishing, it would be a much higher number still just because of the nature of the activities. So um, I, I don't know that, yeah, whatever we did uh, or whatever we do, I think we'll aim more toward understanding what the proportions are that currently exist among those that are out there, rather than trying to oversample for one cohort or another. Yeah, we'll, you answer that we'll, differently, Rob. Yeah, no, we'll definitely push both equally. Um, hunting, of course, is more important to state agencies from a revenue standpoint, and that's a major driver for doing this research. But target shooting, too, of course, majority of your um, PR funds comes from target shooters, not from hunters. So. You know, my thought, at least, is we're going to look at both equally, recognizing it's more interesting in the shooting side, but it's more difficult to get someone into hunting. Therefore, more information may be needed to be more effective in our recruiting and mentoring processes for hunting. So we may have some general discussions the research team needs to have ahead of time going into it, but we did not enter the project favoring one over the other. Uh, focus groups are divided evenly among the groups. The, the recruitment efforts are divided evenly. It's just the way the results worked out. I don't see, well, Chris, I wanted a moment opens up here. I have a point sidetrack. I'll, I'll take care of, let's take care of questions first. Before we do that, please. Okay. If there's any others. Yes, there's one more from Micah and then oh. Ann just uh, tossed one in. So Micah, do you want to come on and ask your question? I'm a little bit confused about how it's typed and I don't want to get it wrong. Sure. So, you know, finding number five is, Significant finding number five there at the beginning says that it, it doesn't really matter. No one really cares about sex, age, or gender when it comes to a mentor. But then again, a lot of times we also hear from different folks saying, hey, you got to have someone who looks like me, my same age, 
uh, women may be more comfortable with a women mentor. So how strong, strong was that finding? Um, and would just like to hear you uh, discuss that more thoroughly. You, you just want to hear a squirm some more. I heard that. Yeah. You, you just want to find the most controversial <laughs> finding. I say that. <laughs> I'll openly squirm on that one. First, first um, thing I'll tell you, Mike, I know Matt has some ideas here, but here's um, number one you always have to take survey results with a grain of salt. Don't believe everything you see, even in research. You got to maintain that cynical mindset. It's like the famous question of how important is it to buy American? Everybody says, oh, it's absolutely more important than anything else. But in reality, it's not really important at all. Same thing is here. During the survey or during focus groups, even you ask people, you know, is there someone you wouldn't want to go with? They're not going to say, that's somebody who looks like that. No, people are they're not going to admit that publicly because socially you're not supposed to say things like that. So, yeah, it's probably more important than the research results came out. But also, we didn't do enough testing the first go around. It's a lot we had to test. We still got to look more into ethnicity, race, um, different age brackets. Uh, and Matt, what are you thinking on that one there? I know we, we talked about doing more yeah. in this area. Yeah, I, uh, everything Rob said is okay, but uh, you know, I'll take more of an um, uh, Enlightenment era logic to it, and that is data are neither friendly nor unkind. They're simply indifferent. Um, it, it surprised us. How much it should surprise us, I don't know. Clearly, people know what they should probably say, how much that drives their behavior. I agree with Rob. I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more. Um, what intrigues me is the strong, I mean, 90%, over 90% said it didn't matter. That's a really large majority over a really good cross-section of people. So it tells me that even though there may be some biases there that will impact their behavior, even though you know, we, we measured maybe their attitude, but a bias may impact their behavior. It lets us know that they're, it's maybe less important than we thought it was, or maybe that if we do a good job making sure we have quality mentors, it might not matter, you know, gender and age might not matter at all. So it, to me, it tells us that we have more flexibility there than maybe we thought we did. But yeah, more research is needed. Um, but I tend to look at it hopefully in that th this is an empowering message rather than one that confirms, yeah, boy, if you're going to have, if you're going to mentor women, you have to have women instructors. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's some things we can do to um, mitigate that to use our resources better. Yeah, I like that on that one. You know, I, I conducted the focus groups and I, we did the focus groups, of course, before the survey. And when that result came out, you know, I, I felt like it was sincere. I mean, sometimes you can kind of tell when somebody's telling you what they think you want to hear. I thought, but I thought, well, this will really come out in the survey, right? Because we're going to have so many more people. And to have the result be confirmed in the survey, I'm, I'm inclined to give it more credence than, you know, going into this. That's why I think it was Rob or one of you said at the top, we were surprised by this. And that's why, because, you know, all common communication theory would suggest they ought to look like you. And I, and I would still stand by that, uh, lacking any other information. But now we have some other information, and I, I think it's pretty compelling from where I sit that it may not matter as much. I mean, if you have all else being equal, make them look like them if you can, of course. But I think it is less important than we originally thought. That's, that's my takeaway from it. I was really surprised by it. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. You know, for me, when I got into it, um, I was mentored by basically all men. And looking back, it wasn't a problem. I think I would have been more comfortable with the female, but I was interested and there were people willing to take me, so I didn't really care what they looked like. Um, and maybe that's more of a millennial thing. You know, it's, it's buying the means to the end. It's not necessarily, I'm going to be picky about how I get to the end. Um, it's, we're just more nitty gritty, I think, than people give us credit for, <laughs> honestly. So um, that would be interesting to explore a little more. I'm definitely, I was surprised by that statistic too. So thanks for talking more about that. Um, Anne from Florida says, is there data that reveals the recruitment of hunters from target shooters? Um, so Anne, maybe you could elaborate on that just a little bit about it, if you're asking hunters versus target shooters or separating the data out. Well, what I was curious about was, um, so state agencies are investing a lot in shooting ranges, and are they seeing an uptick of recruitment 
to hunters from that population that is target shooting. Take that um, wrong. Yeah, well, there's one report that had, that touches on that, an NSSF study released about a year and a half ago that looks at crossover participation. That's how do you get some people done one activity to try another. And one of the paths I recall we looked at was target shooters to try hunting. It also looks at getting hunters to try other types of hunting before they get bored and quit altogether. So that and we have the marketing messages and images in there to use. That's one thing I could look we could look at. But that's something we could consider in the second round of surveys too, separating the data, looking at target shooters who may want to um, try some kind of instruction level to start hunting. So there's a little bit out there. We could look at it some more. The other folks here may have some other ideas. You're breaking up a little bit, Rob. And to the project that you did. What? I was going to refer Anne to, to Rob's projects um, with NSSF. I think that's the best data we have. In, in general, um, what, what the, the, let's say the anecdotal evidence that's out there is that um, it's a lot easier to go from hunting to target shooting than from target shooting to hunting, or diversify from target shooting to different kinds of target shooting than target shooting to hunting. Um, but that exact conversion rate, I think it, it'd be interesting to look at a little bit more, you know, from a state fish and wildlife agency perspective, it, money comes in both ways and having as many as we can of, of either is good. But uh, at a minimum, the, the application is that those who go to shooting sports programs or hunting programs should always have a next step that offers cross pollination to the others, because oftentimes one will spur interest at least um, to increase avidity, if not a switch to the next activity. Good point. So John Legansky just put in the chat, it seems like the best way to confirm the accuracy of these findings would be to follow up with participants of mentor programs with a short survey. Questions that might include, did you like your instructor? Why would you work with them again? Would you refer them to a friend? Um, this would get to the heart of just how well your instructors really are connecting with their respective audiences. And we did some of these questions with Illinois Learn to Hunt when I worked there. And um, we found that those questions really did have bearing on the overall um, satisfaction of the participants with the program. So I definitely think there's some merit to that. But what you put in a post-event survey definitely depends on the kind of activities that you had. So I don't know if there's some recommendations for that other than the templates that we have on the clearinghouse. Um, or if you guys want to weigh in on that at all? Well, just to answer this question directly, uh, you, using past participants of existing programs to correlate to the results of this study, I'd have to think about that a little bit, John, but I, I don't think it would, um, mainly because, the, well, or let me say, the only way that would work is if we could find participants of true mentoring programs or, or true instruction one-on-one -on -one programs, which honestly we didn't find much evidence of out there. They were mainly skills training programs. We would have to find participants of a true mentoring program. Um, and, and those participants would have to cover the range of US demographics. Cause that's what this study was looking at was a broad slice of America. And most of the programs that are out there are already highly selective and biased towards certain audience types, not exclusively, but those that aren't are a teeny, teeny margin. So I would say probably at this point, we don't have the sample size and true mentoring programs that have a diversity of, of participants that would allow us to sort of ground truth. But here's the big but. I absolutely believe that we should be asking those questions of every single mentoring program that we're calling a mentoring program so that we can start gathering some of those data that can at least inform other agencies or give us a little bit of information that might help us ground truth some of these things in the future. So this would be a call. I'll reiterate again something that Rob said is, you know, as, as folks that look at data, evaluate, evaluate, evaluate. Even if it's two or three questions, Afterwards, ask your participants about how things went for them, because only in that will we be able to advance and improve it all. Amen and hallelujah. 
And, you know, these sure. kinds of programs are the hardest ones to do that on, right? I mean, I, I've seen it a hundred yeah. times where you're, you, you finished a big, it's a big undertaking to start with. You got people, you know, coming and going and you, you're going to try to ask them before they walk out the door. It's really hard. You have to put thought into it beforehand to make sure you're, uh, you know, evaluating against stated objectives. And so it's, it's not a small task, but we got to do that more and better all the time. So please, whatever the program is, do more of that. Yeah. And, and John, I, think, I, I see your last comment there. I think that's what you're referring to. And I would agree having a more established way to measure all of these uh, would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And I'll just show you um, quickly. I know that some of you are probably sitting here thinking, well, how do I know if my program is a mentoring program rather than a skills training program? And lucky for you, we have just built a mentorship self-assessment. Um, so I'll put the link in the chat, but the National R3 Implementation Work Group has been working really hard to build this assessment where we took the definition from this study and we broke it into parts and asked questions based on, um, you know, yes or no questions based on if you fit, if your program fits the definition that was described in the study. And if it is, great. If not, it gives you um, a link back to the study so that you can actually look at it. Um, and then there's a whole bunch more that every single question has a reference to what you should be doing and why. Um, so if you did want to self-evaluate and see if you actually line up as a mentorship program or what you can do to be a mentorship program rather than a skills training program, um, I highly recommend this tool. So I'm going to go ahead and give you all that link. You can test it out, it is pretty lengthy. It takes probably 20 minutes to go through it, but you're gonna get all the feedback and all the resources you need from there to build a better program. Rob, did you have one rabbit trail you wanted to go down before we wrapped up? Yeah, no, short in time, I'm gonna change the rabbit trail, going back to John's comment a little bit more here briefly. Um, part of the long-term uniform approach, we also need to really look at cooperating our information because we have a lot of mentoring programs done by the NGOs, but we won't know whether we're successful in creating a new hunter, for example, until they show up and buy a hunting license. We need to cross the, the information that we have out there and have the NGO data tied in with the state agency license data. And over a period of time, because you may take a 12-year-old out as an NGO group on a pheasant hunt, I think Pheasants Forever is doing this, but we won't know whether they convert until they're 16 and have to buy their own license. So long-term data managing, working as a community, sharing data between licensed data and participation information from um, program organizers, be really key for us to ever have the solid insights we need to know what's truly the most effective. So it's a long-term goal. I know we're running out of time, so I'll just keep it short at that. You're all good, we're right on time. So um, with that, it doesn't look like anybody else has questions. Um, but if you do, definitely reach out to Matt, Rob, and Phil. Um, if you need their contact information, let me know. Um, my email is kristen at cast.org. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and these guys, you can put your contact info in the chat too if people don't have it. But I think probably everybody on here has all of our contact info at this point. So um, I will leave it at that. Thank you guys so much for your time um, and your efforts in this report and this study. Um, it's definitely heavily awaited and I'm excited that it's out. I'm excited to start doing stuff with it and putting the implementation part together. So thanks for everyone for joining us. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you.